And now I want to speak to you a word that I, I believe is, um, you know, <laughs> preachers get up and say, I want to speak to you a word. I want to speak to you a lot of words, okay? But a uh, 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 message I, I want to speak on called A Dream Within a Dream. It's one verse, and it'll help you if you'll just, let's rise and, and give uh, honor to the Word of God. Just stand with me. I'm going to do this one verse, and then that'll help you as we settle in for the next 25, 30 minutes. I'm believing God for that. Don't hold me to it, but I'm going to trust Him. It's a, a verse that one phrase just leapt out at me. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 5, we step into a moment when the former servant of Elisha is in the king's presence. He's holding court, and he turns and says, why don't you uh, tell, me about, tell me about that moment? Tell me about what happened. So verse 5, put that on there for me. And Gehazi was telling the king, about the time Elisha brought a boy back to life. Now, everybody likes to hear stories, don't they? Tell me about it. It's gone through. Everybody's heard about it. Everybody knows about it. Tell me about that day that Elisha raised that boy from the dead. I mean, I like to hear that. I mean, I, I mean wouldn't we all? Absolutely. Look at this phrase. At that very moment. But you know, God gives moments. At that very moment, the mother of the boy walked in to make her appeal to the king about her house and land. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, oh God, for your word. Thank you that how you have made us. How have you built us? You built us to dream. And I thank you for it. Oh God, you created us this way. And Lord, even in the middle of this moment and this season, dreams are not going to die. They're going to live. Thank you for holding our dream. You've held us. You hold our hearts. You hold your church in your hands. And you hold our dreams in your hands. We ask you to help us in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Seven years ago, I, I bought into a, a dream. Uh, Pastor Randy had hooked me about coming, but it was... Pastor Ken Peake, who would send me emails and stir inside of me the dream, One Church Can Change the World, 10,000 in attendance, and all of our campuses combined, and all of us together, and 10 million emissions, because uh, he appealed to two things in my life, and that is the advancement of the church and the building of the kingdom of God. I believe the kingdom of God can advance in any season, and I also believe that the church is the instrument of God to go after the souls of the world. His kingdom come, his will be done. Thank you for that one amen. Yeah, the numbers were big and audacious and all of those things, but it was the dream language that I heard. I dreamed, I dreamed. I, I, I knew, I thought, well, if I could combine my strength with his strength and we could, we could move it further, it, it, it was the call, come help me. I was not you know, a man who didn't understand vision. I'd had vision years ago. I, as a young man, I saw what God did over a 30-year period. I started, no staff, no help, and I took off with a vision. I was like a, a man running a marathon. I had to remind myself because often it was like a dash. And then the Lord would add to me a, a few of the people that would help, and we could all fit in one car. We were kind of like a golf team. We were really close together. And we could all fit in one car and we could talk about the dream as we went down the road together. And then became reality is we had to have more on the bench. And so now we graduated from a car to a van where the whole staff could fit in a van. And it was exciting days as we would break one barrier after another. It was kind of like a basketball game. Top five up, next five on the bench and those things like that. Well, then suddenly what happens when growth brings into your life 
more than that, then, then suddenly you're, you're like a football team. You've got an offense and a defense, and you've got enough staff that somebody's leading and somebody's managing because you can bring in growth. And I did it a couple times. I'd fill the place, and then because we didn't have enough people managing the growth, that growth would fall off. And so I, I learned you've got to have an offense, defense, and now we're all together, but we're not working directly together. So now we've got a, a, a bus now we've got a bus, and, and the people are on the bus. They don't know everybody, but all the time they know names. But then as we begin to spread out and other campuses, same as I came here, we, we, it's not, we don't even have same buses. We're Olympic Village now. We all have the same colors, and we all are, are in the same, uh, uh, marching to the, to the same banner because we believe the Encounter Life Church Network don't even, there are staff who don't even know one another from, well, we haven't even met, I haven't met the staff in Mexico City yet. I'm going to go in a, in a couple months to go meet the pastor that's in the network of Encounter Life Network in Mexico. I'm excited about that. I, I, God has added unto us because now as we have that dream to go forward, God is honoring that. That's what happens. That's, that's what a vision can do. A vision, but but, but it's beyond more than that because to love one another in community and to go for the same vision is one thing, but to have a dream. See, it all started with a dream. Somebody's dream, somebody dream came to Georgia. Maybe they were here, I don't know. But somebody had a dream and put up a tent and experiment over there. I keep rehearsing this for you because I want you to understand this ain't the last thing God's going to do. How many knows that God has got a plan that's bigger than all of us and he is going to advance his kingdom? It's absolutely important. Every, uh, every other year or so, Pastor would, would take uh, a busload of our students up to Tekoa to show him how about the dream, how the dream started for him. Because dreams are important, but it all starts with a dream that was a dream in a dream within a dream. You understand, none of us are dreaming apart from somebody else who dreamed. I had a conversation with Whitney on Friday, and I said, "Hun, you you're, you're living the dream, but you're living the dream inside the dream of your father. And that dream is living inside of the dream of my grandmother. My grandmother, my, my mother had a challenging life. Uh, her first child passed, and my mother suffered from that all of her life. And occasionally, I could get her to dream. When I would travel the world, I'd say, Mother, I'm living your dream. And she'd smile and said, oh, yes, tell me about it. I said, come on, Mother, go with me. Now. No, sir, I ain't getting out of this house. You go to Africa and make sure, you, make sure that God wants you to go when you go. And then we had a lot. Why? There's a dream inside. Dream inside of somebody that, that caused that to be over there uh, where Hobby Lobby is and now here and in that corner and that building and now this third main building for this body. There's a dream that placed all of this. There's a dream from some, somewhere some, in the life of a, of a woman named Helen Funk who decided to leave Montana and come to West Virginia. And because they wouldn't let women pastor at the time, they would let women start churches. That doesn't make no sense, does it? Did I? Did he say that? Yes, I just said that, you know. Uh, and so she came to a coal town, and her and her sister would raise up an Assembly of God church. And, and, and 40 years after she'd raised that church up, I'd get saved in that church. It was a dream of hers. And then later on, I'd get to pastor the woman in her last 15 years of her life. I pastor the woman. She had a dream, but I had a dream inside of her dream. Inside, you all understand that my dream and your dream always fit inside of somebody else because somebody else made a dream that went forward. I think about the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Isn't it an amazing thing that somebody dreamed to make the dream of somebody else come true? That's pretty powerful. Well, David had a dream to build a temple in 2 Samuel, and God knew it, and he told God about it, the prophet, he told the prophet, and that dream come to pass, but David didn't even get to build that dream. We understand that we called it Moses' tabernacle, and David had a tent where he loved God so much, and he wanted the presence of God. He brought the presence of God. He brought the Ark of the Covenant, placed it inside that tent, but he wanted, he wanted that, that Ark to reside in something bigger and better than that, and so God, he dreamed a dream of a, a massive temple, and Solomon built a temple that was not his dream. It was David's dream, and now we call it Solomon's Temple and all that. But that was David's dream. You know, Jesus has a dream for you and I. Do you know that? 
Jesus dreams over you. He, he said it. He prays. I believe when you have a dream, it comes out in your prayer language. And when you have a dream, it comes out of, it leaks out of you. And sometimes you, you can be very excited and tell people about your dream. But oh, be careful sharing the dream with someone who has lost a dream or, or a dead eye who are walking in their sleep and never dream because they are those who are dream releasers and they are dream crushers. And that's not even in the notes. That's free today. <laughs> Jesus says this, I'm praying not only for these disciples, listen to this, but for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they'll be one. There's a power in being one in unity. Just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, that they may be in us. Why? Why would God want us to be one in him? So that the world may believe you sent me. His dream was that we would be so united in him together that we could draw others to believe in him. Abraham had a dream. Isn't it amazing? Abraham dreamed just for a son. You see, the only way to live forever in that day was to have a son who would pass on your name. Pass on your name. So Abraham dreams of a son. But the only problem about that, God had a bigger dream for Abraham than just a son. God dreamed for him to have nations. And we know that because every one of us in this church believing in God and worshiping him today, we're living inside of Abraham's dream. We are a part of that dream. Here it is in Romans 4, 18. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. But let's go back to that original verse. That very moment about a woman who walks in, a nameless woman. She's nameless. The back story is in 2 Kings chapters 4 through 8. But uh, she's a, a, a woman that's called notable in one translation. A notable woman. And, and this woman uh, has apparently some love for God, some deep respect for the things of God. She's noticing that there's a prophet going back and forth in the land. And one day she invites him and says, why don't you come in and let's eat. And she, he eats with her and her husband. As he, as he sits there, I, I wonder if Elisha ever looks and says, where's the children? There's no children. But this is a wealthy family. But there's one thing that she has married an older man. And whether he's not able to bear children or whatever, for whatever reason, there's no children. Uh, but she, not, she has some sense inside of her that God ought to, ought to do something with their lives. For them. And so she turns to her husband and says, would you build a room on? Let's build that room upstairs. Let's build an upper room. Let's place inside that room a bed, a table, a, 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 a chair, and a lamp. Let's put all of that in there. And, and, and let's believe and she built an upper room. Oh, if I could take a week right now and talk to you about that upper room, that that bed represent the bed of resurrection, that that table met, represented the bed of refreshment, that that lamp was the bed of, I mean, was the lamp of revelation. If I could take a moment, but we'll just leave the upper room for another day and, and just know that she built an upper room. What was she building? She was building a place for her dream to become a reality and she didn't even know it. All she's doing is obeying God. Let me tell you something. Obedience to God promotes dreams. When you obey God, your dream is being promoted down. When you obey God, something has happened. And inside that upper room, there would be a prophet, a dreamer of sorts, a dream releaser. And one day God tells him about her dream. God tells her about a dream. One day he's re being refreshed. Laying on the bed, he calls his servant Gehazi and he says, Gehazi, they have been very generous to us. God has used them. And he's prompted my heart that there's something that they're, uh, Gehazi says, they don't need anything. It's obvious. Oh, I tell you, you know, listen to Gehazi's faith. She doesn't have a son. Oh, okay. And without it, almost, it's as if when you're reading it, it's as if oh, the prophet says, oh, okay, that's it. That's it. Call her in. And she calls up the steps and comes up to that upper room. And he says to her, a nameless woman from Shunema, a Shunemite woman who he says to her, I understand you have no son. Th about this time next year, about this time next year, you're going to have a son. And what did she go? No, don't do that to me. Don't get me 
my hopes up. Don't tell me something that is not true. Boy, you're talking about a moment that God showed. God revealed her inner dream. See, God has called, God has put inside of us all dreams. They're in deep inside of us, and there's nothing more deeper than a mother has for a child, a father has for a son, and all of those dreams are inside of us, and they're crying out to God, and as we obey God, we are getting closer and closer, and about a year later, guess what? A year later, there comes a son. Couldn't be more happier. Couldn't be more thrilled. Couldn't absolutely have, I mean, her dream has come true. Her dream has happened. I was in a moment in Armenia. My, uh, Whitney had just graduated from high school and she's got my iPad right sitting in front of me, probably three feet away. And I have an interpreter and she's giving my notes to me in English on an iPad. She had just graduated from high school and uh, she wanted to come with me on a mission field. And I've got a room and the Holy Spirit is, I mean, this place is like exploding with revelation and, and powerful things were happening. And I mean, people, were, men were getting up, folding their arms, shaking their head and shaking all over. And I mean, it was just one of those moments. And I stopped right in the middle and says, my dream is happening right before me. And I address my daughter in that moment. Place it that. There, there are moments when suddenly the dream is within reach. It's, there's happening. And a son comes to her. Oh, a wonderful son. Then a little bit later on, Elisha calls her up and says, listen, you guys, you, you, you and your, your son, get out of the country. And she leaves to Philistine, to the Palestine. We know it's Palestine. There's going to be famine coming, famine coming. You go ahead, and she leaves that farm and all those blessings. There's an inference here that her husband may have passed. And then we tune in to that verse that I share with you. When seven years is up, just like said, she comes back at this very moment. Don't forget that. At this very moment, she walks in. What is she? She walks in. While Gehazi is telling the story, because after that little boy had been born, when he got old enough to run out with the harvesters, he hit his head and he dies. And they lay him on the prophet's bed. And I'll tell you what I believe. I believe that when God gives you a dream, he'll resurrect anything he needs to resurrect to complete that dream. If God gives you a dream, you will not enter heaven until that dream gets fulfilled. I believe that with everything inside of me. And that boy gets resurrected. And he tells the story. Gehazi's telling, at the moment when the woman walks in with the son, what is she walking in for? She said, I, she knows that it's seven years. The prophet told her. She walks back in the king and says, can I have my property? Can I have my thing? Listen to this. Not only does the king give her back her house and her property, he says if anybody moved in and they made any profit on your property, if they used your equipment to do her, your, your job, if they used her assets to make something happen, she is to be restored. Everything that happened in the seven years, you think God is not going to be faithful to his church in a moment like this? That God is not going to let the enemy steal anything from you? or from the kingdom of God. I believe this with everything inside of me. Nothing shall be stolen from you that, that God will allow you to go to heaven and say, I'm sorry, I almost made it happen for you. But you know that pandemic kind of caught me off guard. Are you kidding? I'm telling you, God is going to say, see, I have kept you and I have resurrected everything that I have promised you and I have made sure the enemy shall not restore and I will return it sevenfold, tenfold, a hundredfold. God is a restorer and he will bring it to pass at that very moment. I love that moment in my life when God has, it's like the whole planets have come in line for a moment. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But we know another dreamer. Oh, Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac has a couple sons, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob lives within the dream of his father and his grandfather. We know it's called, always called, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We know that Jacob was a dreamer. And all of his story is played out in Genesis 28 to 33. Pastor, why do you say that? Because people think I make this stuff up. It's Bible. Hallelujah. Amen. 
And in Genesis 28, 20 through 33, we read the story of imperfect people like you and I and a man named Jacob who is a dreamer. Let's talk about some dream questions that happen. I, I wonder out loud with you and I, because if I'm going to have my dream, I got to I got to keep myself encouraged until my dream comes to pass, and I gotta I gotta know what's happening in the middle. And through Jacob, we can see some things. Number one, Jacob, no doubt, probably needed to ask himself, "Am I in a season that I am fulfilling a promise to receive to get to my dream?" See, God will let you make promises, and those promises He wants us to hold true. And Jacob had has the dream of his father Abraham, but Jacob's dream we know really is a wife. There's nothing wrong with you having a dream for a spouse or a child or anything other else. God placed inside of us dreams. And so Jacob dreams for a wife, and we know what happens. He has to work out 14 years of service. He has to stay true to his promise because when you stay true to your promise, it's not going to prevent your dream from coming to pass. Not only the 14 years is God's way of proving your character and getting you ready for your dream. You know, and I know God can bring a dream to pass in a sudden moment. But sometimes God uses promises that we have to work out until that moment happens. I don't know about you, but there were times that I was, I, I, I have felt on my way to my dream that I have, uh, like it was, has almost forever to where I actually believe maybe I didn't have that dream. It happened such that way for us. We were young pastors. And um, when, we got, when we first came into this moment in 1987, uh, uh, Lindsay was about a year and a half old. And for 10 years, I never went anywhere, never did anything. I mean, I, 10 years, I, I stayed absolutely faithful in that church and, and uh, never, I, I never had anything that was beyond that moment that happened. I, I was doing everything I knew for God to do. And suddenly we get a call. And uh, Phyllis and I flew to St. Louis. And uh, she had heard me talk about the dream. She'd heard me stand in front of a people and talk about, a, talk about what God was going to do. And for 10 years, it didn't seem like there was very much evidence that he was going to do it. But we talked about it for 10 years. We flew to St. Louis and, and um, had a great meal with a wonderful group of people. And um, heard and they took us over. And it was almost as if I stepped into everything I said was going to happen in West Virginia. Here it is right here in this moment. It's right here in front of me. What I'm, I'm seeing and we get back into the, to the room, and uh, Phil says to me, uh, what do you think? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. She says these words, this feels like a shortcut. Oh, I, you know, it's really tough when the voice of God sounds like your wife. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I thought, oh, man, I wrestled all night long. And, uh, in fact, I told the gentleman who came to get me, I said, we just need to go to the airport. He says, well, we've got this meeting this morning. I said, I know, but... I, I'm not coming here. And so when I went back in the room, uh, I, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came on and I began to speak to them about their future. And there was a man in the room who had been helping them. And I said, let me ask you a question. Why wouldn't you consider this man to be your pastor? For God's sake, the Lord is using him in this season. Hey, listen, when you ain't running for nothing, you just tell all the truth. I've learned to live that way. Hey, listen, what, where God puts you, no man can take you out. And when man puts you somewhere, they can take it. But when God puts you somewhere, they can't. And so I, I wasn't, Robert, I didn't have no, have no sense of, uh, uh, and I thought this might help me to get to the airport a little quicker. But I just, I just thought, you know what happened? When I left the room, they voted that man in as pastor. Right before that, just probably right before the people in that one moment. We went back, and the following summer, the following summer, you could hear the sound. Something happened on a Sunday night. The sound of the heavens broke loose. And we moved into a 10-year period that we could not build fast enough. And we could not. Everything we dreamed happened in a matter of a 10-year period. From that moment on, we could see. In fact, for the next 13 years, it's as if I, I'd be concerned about what I was, you know, dreaming about. Because if I dreamed it out loud, people started bringing money and started to want it to happen. Because it was a great season. 
I have learned something about seasons. There are dream seasons and there are dream releasing seasons. And the dream season is the moment where you declare by faith what God wants to do. And then if you can hang in there long enough, God will make me. He'll, he'll resurrect everything around you. But he will bring to pass his dream in your life and you'll see it happen. Is anybody with me today? What was, what was happening? Well, he was doing something in his character. Number two, is God adding something to your life while you're waiting on the dream? Is God adding something to your life? Well, you see, Jacob's living inside of his father and grandfather's dream. But while he's there, God is adding something. It's obvious God, God is adding to Jacob wealth. He's adding to him his family. He's adding to him his maturity. Something's happened to him. Number three, I, I like this dream question. Am I needing further development while I wait on my dream? Now, nobody wants to know this, but sometimes God says, I could give you your dream, but it would ruin you. I need, to, I need you to wait, and I need you to be developed. I need, there is a season of preparation. There's a season where God plants the seeds inside of you, and he grows you so that you might be ready when the dream happens. And in that moment, we understand that Jacob was bringing back to a place called Bethel, and this time, instead of the house of God, he meets the God of the house because he says, this is El Bethel. This is the God of the God of the house. And I'm telling you, it's one thing to know that God's in the house. It's another thing to know that God is in this house inside of you and that he's leading you. You've got a dream and that dream's got to fit within every place that you are. I, one of the main important things that we're doing and what we're trying to do is we're trying to release dreams inside of people's life. We're trying to say, get your friends together, dream together, become a life group together and let that dream fit inside of this dream so that we can see the harvest happen so that we can reach people. Every one of life group needs to reach people. That's what we're trying to do. We're reaching souls for Christ. Why? Because the dream is that God allowed this to be built. You think for us, for, for me to look at brown pews every week and just speak to cameras? God's going to fill this place. I'm telling you, God's going to fill this place with people who are absolutely has a dream that's in here. What does that have to do with plans, Pastor? Plans are to be written down and worked out on a daily basis. What about visions? Visions are for seasons and visions are those moments. We have a vision for this coming year and, and for that next year. But a dream, it lives inside of you for lifetimes. A dream lives inside of your life. Your whole life moves toward a dream. You understand we work the plan. We write the vision. But we hold on to the dreams inside of us. We hold inside of us. I was walking and looking at the choir then I happened to see Kim in that choir, Kim Pendleton. Pastor and I was in Dallas. We were there for another reason, but we happened to go see a friend of his that of course become a dear friend of mine, Rick DeBose. Rick was the district superintendent of the North Tex Texas district. And we're upstairs talking with him. He goes, hey, guys, I need to go downstairs here. Won't you go down with me? And we go downstairs, and he introduces us to a team of people and talks about how that they were creating a place to be able to help with the taking care of foster children and adoption and, and all that. We got back on the plane. I couldn't hear nothing, couldn't think of nothing. I turned to Pastor and said, Pastor, this is part of your legacy, how you were adopted and what God has done through you. And, and I said, this is, this is an important piece. And from that moment, I said to him, I believe, you know, Mike and Kim have been going to those camps each year called the Royal Kids Camps. And they've got a, they've got a heart for, for the orphan. They've got a heart for the, 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 the fatherless. They've got a heart. I said, they could be our heroes in this. And Kim, I, I, that very day on that plane, I said, can I go back? And, and Pastor said, I think you're on to something. And fortify. guess what? It's a dream that's placed inside of a dream. And we knew that that dream was bigger than just this church because now it's all over. Hey, by the way, I was arguing with God and said, God, I knew there was one more thing that I needed in West Virginia. And, and I, feel, I feel like you didn't tell me this. And he said, yes, I brought you here, that I brought you south, that it might go north. And we've even helped them now because Fortify is beyond this church. It's a dream inside of the dream. But it's going to go outside to others, and, and it's going to go. It's going to bring blessing to many, many others and many other states. Why? Because that's what dreams do. Dreams in God advance and grow. 
Am I speaking to anybody that's got a dream in this room today that God has something for you? Let me tell you what I believe. Let me get a couple more things. Dreams are the difference in the minutes and the moments. At that very moment, she walked in. I started thinking about it. At that very moment, stay right there. Dreams are the difference. What? You put in the minutes every day that you might have a moment when the dream comes up. You put in the minutes. It's logging in every day. You attach yourself to the Wi-Fi of heaven and you put in your minutes. Why? Because all the minutes add up to a moment, to a moment in God. A moment that everybody else would say, well, isn't that a coincidence? You know it's not a coincidence. You put in the minutes and the minutes have been adding up. And God says, it, I, you know what? I think this minute, minute would be a great minute for a moment in me. And you have a moment in God. And it's a supernatural moment when God has absolutely brought all the minutes together for that moment. I don't know who I'm speaking today to. I hope, I, I hope every heart is hearing me in some way that God has inside of you. You got time for one more? Do I need to park, the, do I need to land this plane or can I have just one more minute? Would you, would you stay with me online for this one, my mom? Uh, I'm, uh, I never was a, a, a presbyter. I was never an officer or anything in the district. The Lord used us to raise up a, a ministry school that went across, um, across all the assemblies. 35 districts in the assemblies of God has some of that began in our church as a way to train ministers and stuff. But uh, I become assistant superintendent. And... Uh, we're coming out of enormous debt, four pages of owed bills, four different mortgages. And one of them is with the Assemblies of God, their loan department, our district. And I would go once a month and I would feel the weight of all that. And so I, I started saying to our superintendent, I said, I believe God's going to lift this off of us so that we can advance this I am a child of camps. I love camp. I mean, I got filled with the Holy Spirit at camp. I got baptized uh, with everything that God could ever do me in the sawdust of a camp. I got called to the ministry in camp. I love the camp system. I love that whole camp meetings. I love getting away from all of the distractions and be able to separate for a week and, and enjoy community with all. I mean, come, I didn't even know that there were other kids saved when I was a teenager. And that came from Virginia and West Virginia. We'd come to camp. And so I realized what's happening is we can't develop our campgrounds because of this. And so I dream about being out from under that debt. I literally had a dream in December. I literally had a, 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 a dream one night. And in that dream, I'm in front of the superintendent of the Assemblies of God, Brother Trask, Thomas Trask. I'm in front of him and I'm begging him and I'm saying, you are holding our children's inheritance in hostage. Now I thought, who are you to say anything like that? I mean, I had never ever met him. So the next day, in my youthful enthusiasm, I called the superintendent and said, hey, you won't believe this. I told him the dream. In the dream, when I said this, the superintendent didn't say anything. He just took his hand and went like this. And when he moved his hand across the sky, he painted like a brush $500,000. So I told my superintendent, you ain't said to me, what did you have to eat? I felt embarrassed and ashamed until two weeks later. He says, I got to apologize to you. I can't get beyond your dream. He said, um, but I'm telling you what, God apparently is going to use you. So you got to call Brother Trask and get an appointment. What are you kidding me? So I found his itinerary that was going to be two months later in a campgrounds in Indiana. We made a phone call and said, can we have breakfast with you, sir? Now, it's one thing to be in a dream. You can be all bold and strong and think that, you know. When I got in front of that man, my knees was buckling and, and uh, it was a buffet and they hugged. They know one another and he introduced me and we go to the buffet and they're getting all this food. I can't even eat. The wonderful thing happened. Our superintendent talked for an hour. 
I never said a word. Never said a word. Finally, at the very end, Brother Trask is the speaker for the, for the event. He puts his chair out, stands up, and, and he says, uh, now, now tell me again, don't give me all that. Just give me the bullet points. And he goes down the list and says, well, we owe, we owe this and this. And, well, we owe a million dollars to the students of God, but we haven't been able to pay anything. And we have accrued interest on that for the last 10 years of $500,000. And Brother Trask does this. Well, we're going to have to get rid of that with his hand. And when he did, I began to tremble inside of me. Never said a word the entire time. As, I, as we left that meeting, Brother Trask said, he's committed to paying this and that. I think it's going to be over a million dollars. He come back two months later and says, you know what happened? They forgave us of $525,000 worth of interest in a single swoop. I'm telling you, dream! Pastor, don't you understand the day we're in? Dream! Don't you understand? Don't let loose of your dream. God is going to resurrect everything he needs to do to bring the dream to pass.